Due Process, winner of 21 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights and the 2012 Mid-Atlantic Emmys for Outstanding Interview Special and Outstanding Discussion Series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law in Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. It's remarkable how grace works in our lives. You know, when we're broken, we begin to understand that there's a potential to have a different value shift. This is now Jim McGreevy, end product of a nine-year transformation from the power of the governor to the piety of the pulpit by way of scandal, disgrace, and service. The man who once called the shots in the State House now calls on women inmates to find the redemption he says he's found. A journey chronicled in a new HBO documentary titled appropriately, Fall to Grace. Jim McGreevy on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. You don't have to be from New Jersey to remember Governor Jim McGreevy, who made national headlines nine years ago when he declared while walking away from the office, I am a gay American. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King, and a new HBO documentary tells the story of McGreevy's self-reinvention, or as the doc calls it, his fall to grace. And just in case you've forgotten just what that fall looked like, the shell-shocked wife, the anguished father, the soon-to-be ex-governor disgraced, here's a clip to remind you. Jim McGreevy announcing his resignation and he took everyone by surprise with his explanation. At a point in every person's life, one has to look deeply into the mirror of one's soul and decide one's unique truth, not as we may want to see it or hope to see it, but as it is. And so my truth is that I am a gay American. And that much is still true, though Jim McGreevy is here to tell us that he's a new and a better man. Jim, welcome. Right, thank you. As you walked away from that microphone, did you have any concept of what was coming next? I mean, what was in your mind about the future? It's a good question, right? Um, I think I just wanted to get through the day and obviously to reassemble my life. One thing that a dear friend said to me, though, look at this as an opportunity that not many people in their mid-40s have an opportunity to reassess their life and their direction. And this was, frankly, weeks after he said, if there's anything that you could do, what would it be? And I took that question, and that helped to lead me to the road to seminary. Weren't you tempted to say, yeah, right, an opportunity. <laughs> I've lost my career. I've lost my reputation. I have no idea where I'm going next. No, I think that would have been saying, I think that would have been the natural inclination. But one of the things that I've learned working with women, and I remember Governor Kane always saying that crisis has two faces. It's either opportunity or disaster. So it's what our response to it is. Um, in AA and NA, we use the line, the serenity prayer from Reinhold Niebuhr often, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, namely ourselves, and the wisdom to know the difference. But were you wise enough at that point? No, no, I no, I mean, no. you said in the speech, triumph and disaster are the same thing. Did you really believe that? No, not at that point, but, it, it, you know, it, it was wonderfully liberating to embrace my authenticity, who I was, after a lifetime of a divided self, after a lifetime of, of pushing away who I was in terms of my sexual orientation. So at one hand, it was very freeing, and on one hand, obviously, debilitating. Jim, before we 
talk further. Let's take a quick look at HBO's capsule version of the Fall to Grace documentary. Laura, let's roll the HBO trailer, which begins with what now sounds like a sadly ironic line from the old days. People will know that Jim McGreevy, that I'll do the right thing. What I have is my integrity and my honor. For me, it was the need to be acclaimed, the need to be adored, which ultimately brings destruction. And so my truth is that I am a gay American. So in the first act of your life, you had two wives, two daughters. Tell me about act two. Coming out was a great gift. And I'm like, I'm gay. Seminary was something that I always wanted to do. It's remarkable how grace works in our lives. I feel that I am called to help these women. We started to call him the dream seller. We don't even believe in ourselves like that. So keep selling us this dream. We're on this journey together. I mean, selfishly, it gives me purpose. No one should be defined by the nadir of their existence, by the lowest point in their lives. Everybody deserves a second chance. So, Jim, we're in a sort of a moment of time travel here. So let me go back for a moment to drum thwack it. And you walk out one day before the events uh, at that microphone, and suddenly you have a road to Damascus moment. And the Jim McGreevy, that's this new man, the one who's working with women in prisons, is standing in the governor's office. What's your highest priority? You, this Jim McGreevy, the one who's sitting right here, this is Jim in the governor's well, office. I think it would still be early childhood literacy. I mean, I see so many of the women with whom I work not having the capacity to read, not having the capacity to be educated, and that's frustrating. I mean, this, this state of our schools, because ultimately if a young person is given the ability to be, if they're properly educated, if they're given the tools to compete in an economic system, there's the opportunity for employment. Um, and in terms of myopically, where I'm at right now, I would radically change how we do incarceration in this state. And that's a change from where you were before. Oh, of course. I mean, Ray, I, and, and, and God rest his soul, your father knew that I was, I was a system prosecutor. I had the privilege of being executive director of the state parole board um, for Governor Kane. I was, you know, law and order. I came from, you know, a family of police officers. But I remember, you know, when I was a young assistant prosecutor in Middlesex County, and they start you out in the juvenile division. And I had worked in summer camps, and the smartest kids in public housing were the entrepreneurs selling drugs. And there was something even back then that said to me, we're not doing this right, because these kids are selling this commodity, you know, a CDS, and they're gaining money for it. And so at, on some level, they're entrepreneurs, they're capitalists. Based on this journey, and you are back there. What's the po what's the policy difference in terms of how you would approach oh. incarceration in well, New Jersey you know, based on what you've sure. seen? Sure. I mean, incarceration years. doesn't work. I mean, two thirds of the people, you know, within three years of release, they come back with another felony within three years. It's just, excuse me, but it's a stupid system. It's a very expensive, stupid system in terms of what it costs the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey. And more to the point, it doesn't work. But do we We're have to get changing. the whole leadership of the state on the journey you've just walked? In order no, to get to, get you know, I, I think you know the governor and the legislature on a bipartisan basis, Senator uh, Cunningham, Senator Lesniak, uh, Senator Sweeney, they recognize that we need to do drug treatment differently. I mean, the governor has expanded drug treatment in terms of drug courts and the Supreme Court. But what we need to do is we need to do prisons fundamentally differently. But Jim, I wonder, could you have been elected if you said things like that? It would have been popular. Campaign? It wouldn't have been popular to say we need to do prisons differently. But you know what's no, 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 But you went even further. Uh, prisons don't work. work. They don't work. We've got to stop incarcerating mass numbers of people. Yeah, That's where we, you are yeah, exactly. now, Exactly. Right? Oh, yeah. It's, you couldn't have said it then. But no, did you couldn't have said it. But you can't did say you? it now and get elected. That's not No, you're probably court. true. You're probably, but, Ray, you know, you look at Chuck Holson. I mean, there was, there's nobody more conservative than Chuck Holson. You look at conservative Republicans, and I think there's a there's a... The embers of a growing movement by both in the left and the right that says this system. I mean, we are we are the largest incarcerators in the world. We're number one. Russia's number two, and then Rwanda. We're five percent of the world's population and twenty-five percent of the world's incarcerated population. And we can't keep doing this. It's expensive and it doesn't work. And when you look at it, and you look but at our huge economic and psychological investment in that. And the journey you've been on is, at least as it's portrayed, a spiritual journey. Yeah. So how does that mesh with the process of changing this? 
Well, you look at what happened in terms of California. I mean, at some point in time, the, the Supreme Court, the California State Legislature, the governor's office, we can't continue. In the state of New York, for the first time in history, the amount spent on incarceration is larger than the amount spent on public higher education. So if we're going to keep pushing an ever-increasing amount of our financial resources into locking people up, there's a cost. Okay, so Jim, that's the practical argument. You now have another argument that comes from a different place. But before we leave, who you were before. Unlike so many of us who are committed on these issues, you were in a position to do something about them. When you look back with who you are now at what you didn't do then, what makes you cringe the most? Not making it a priority. I mean, the, the, the rea you know, I think there's so many things that come to a, a governor's plate. And I think on, on questions of education, hopefully the Highlands, um, we were responsive. But I never saw, Sandy, I never saw the prison population as something that is growing and getting worse. I never saw it for the cancer that it is. Because I, I'll just speak for my sensibility. I thought that prisons were something that was static, bad people in bad places, and I'm going to drive by. And that's how it should be. You were a and hard I, guy to even get a pardon from. Yeah, and but but you know I, I would go to you know having worked for Governor Kane the parole board I would go into the prisons, I would go to uh, midnight mass in East Jersey State Prison, year after year as mayor of Woodbridge, and I and I knew some of the guys. So and on one level, on a personal level, I would know that you know this is a good person or she's a good person, but I never I mean coming out of. I never questioned the whole foundation of the system. And the whole foundation of the system says that if Jim does something wrong, we're going to put you in this place for X number of years, we're going to look on this graph, and we're going to keep you there. And the reality is while you're there, you do almost nothing. It's pure punishment. But, but it's, it's, it's even crazier. I say to the conservatives, Ray, it's, it's, you're, not, you're not even like, you know, you go back to some of the great old movies of, of San Quentin, you go back, and guys aren't even working. I mean, they're, they're so part but, of this is... I'm curious as to how this sorry. translates. There's a movie that we've just looked at, which is the documentary, and it talks about your personal interaction, in, much of it about your interaction with women inmates. That's, to some extent, a question of otherness, because the people in the prisons are black, they're Latino, and if they're white, they're usually poor. So it's caste, and it's class, and it's color, and it's zip code. You've been through a spiritual transformation which involved wrecking your old life, not consciously, but nonetheless, and a movement which has been painful and deep. Does it mean that the only way that you get leadership to move is to have people with these kinds of transformational experiences to see through the glass of otherness? It's a <laughs> very profound question. Well, that's why you're uh, here, to answer no, the questions. No, I don't questions. know. You better find somebody with a, with a greater depth of thought. You know, it, it's... It's all of what you said. I mean, the people in prison are, are brown and black. They're also white. I think it's, you know, what's, what's frustrating to me is when 20 kids die in the city of Newark, I can't find it in a newspaper. When 20 white children die, I can find it all over the national headlines. And, and different, different circumstances. But we have grown, inured, or complicit with the idea that urban education can be a failure, young African-American males belong behind bars, and that this is the way it is. Let me ask you one question about race, which jumps out. If you watch the documentary with the sound off, it's Jim McGreevy hanging out with a bunch of black people. I mean, really, that's the, the visual image. And at one point, you do say, I'm good in the hood. It's white people that don't like me. And I know some of that was in jest. But there is a sense of you being embraced by people at the bottom of the socioeconomic life, yeah, and, people and, who are powerful. And I think when I, when I was first in the seminary, I, I felt when I went up to Harlem, when the dean of the seminary, um, Father Ewing, said, well, go up there. I mean, part of it was because I felt comfortable. I, I knew that people who had just come out of prison for 15 years, 20 years, weren't going to hold judgment against me, ironically, because of my, ho my own set of circumstances. Um, and then I, I began to develop friendships with men and women. And if I can't, 
The, the other point, Ray, is, is that people copy the behavior with which they witness as a young child. And, and spending, you know, now for the past three years, time with women behind bars, my sense is, and you look at all the behavioral psychologists, is that people replicate the behavior that was, that was before them. And so for the many of the women that I worked with, they witnessed, whether it's in the Camden Public Housing or Newark or Jersey City or wherever, people doing drugs, copping drugs, gunning and running, and that was their life. That's what they understood. That's what everybody did. And so then when a young woman goes out and does that, and she's arrested, or she goes out and does that and joins a gang to survive, to get through the day because her mother is a crack prostitute and her father has abandoned them, then we put her in jail with people that have even worse behaviors. Okay, and then given all of that, you say these women and men can still find redemption. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And I want to give credit to the county executive, Tom DeGees in Hudson County and Oscar Villas and the freeholders, the program we have in Hudson County is now is financed from Attorney General Eric Holder and the Second Chance Program, and we were just authorized through 2015. And this would not have happened besides the Hudson County leadership, but we've changed the matrix. I mean, whether it's judges, the prosecutors, the public defenders, as well as the warden, now says our goal is to reduce the probability of people coming back. And that typically isn't done. If you go to the Department of Corrections today in the state of New Jersey, or you go to the Attorney General's office, or you go to the state legislature, their matrix for determining their effectiveness isn't based on reducing recidivism. Hudson County has done that. And I think, you know, we've made great prides, great progress. I mean, uh, Gary Lanigan and DOC, and people are personally committed, but institutionally what's happened in Hudson County is nothing short of a miracle. Our recidivism rate for the women is 22%. That means four to five women go out and they don't come back. So those are practical considerations. Yeah. But and for financial. You, but for you, there's a whole spiritual oh, sure. element to all of this. And before we talk about what that is, uh, Laurel, let's roll that clip in which Jim declares, I am that woman in jail. The reward is in that. It's understanding that the punishment is in the sin and how we act. The harm is what we do to ourselves. And being in the closet is a prison of sorts. And for a gay man, there were so many times in my life where I felt filled with shame and guilt and ugliness. And now, sort of to move through this, I hope to do that for these women. I am that woman in jail. No different. Jim, one of the things that I've um, been so struck by as I've talked to people who've seen the duck, mm. and uh, a lot of people are watching it, at least here in New Jersey, um, this has become must see viewing. How can Jim McGreevy say, I am that woman in jail? How can he compare his second chance to their second chance? How can he compare the way that he lives. You now live, courtesy of your intended, like a millionaire. Mm. How can you compare that? How can you compare the education you had and, and all of the advantages you'd had coming to your second chance with how dismal the chances are for these women you work with? Well, perhaps I said it inartfully. What I was trying to express is not that they oper these women started so much further back than I did. Um, and I'm acutely aware of it. But what I was trying to do was to go to say, to, to raise question. If we don't identify, well, if I don't identify with these women as human beings, one, it becomes very easy for me to be in a position of greater than, less than, which is, you know, people don't need patriarchy. They don't need, they need someone who's meeting them where they are. One of the great lessons that I learned working in hospice and seminaries, you need to meet people where they're at, not, you know, where you want them to be. And so I think my goal is to, to, to be open to feeling their pain and their reality. Um, and secondly, I think a spiritual truth is, is that we can behave our way into thinking. We can't think our way into behaving. And so it's working with a woman and saying, we have a code of behavior that we're all going to abide by in this jail. 
in terms of how we interact with each other, um, in terms of the work we do, in terms of the structure that we do. So when I say I am that woman, it means I'm on the same moral level as those women. I am equal before my sense of God with those women. And those women need and deserve the opportunities that whatever we can provide for them. Let me ask you another question that begs asking. Sure. One of the things you say in the video is that your drug of choice as a governor and a politician was adulation, adoration. You say it's true of many politicians, entertainers, you mentioned the church, mm. or churches generically. Um, but here's a documentary featuring Jim McGreevy. The obvious question is, is, this, Why do it? is it the same fix, just at a different level or in a different subject? Yeah. What's the connection? No, I, I, when Alexander first came to me, um, and she sat down with Mark and me, and we said, no, thank you. And, you know, <laughs> Mark said it's a little clearer than that. Um, I noticed he only makes a cameo. Yeah, in exactly. <laughs> I mean, this isn't a shtick. And, you know, um, and so basically, Ray, we pushed back. And then Alexander said, can I come into, can I come in behind bars and spend time with the women? And so she came in to be spend time with the women. And she came a couple times. I mean, just sitting there. And then she came with, she has a small little handheld camera. And at some point, we actually asked the woman, do, do we want to do this? It's about a community decision. We have a, a woman who's a head of structure, and it's a community decision. Some women said no, but the majority of women said yes. And I think at that early fledgling moment, Alexander wasn't even sure whether or not there was a documentary. I mean, she did it over the course of between 18 and 24 months. And I think what, what changed it for me was, even to go back to what Sandy had said earlier, people aren't aware of people behind bars, let alone women behind bars, who are a minority within a minority, insofar as, you know, within the prison culture, within the jail culture, women are a very discreet and insular minority, unfortunately growing. And I think Alexandra's camera and her sensitivity, I mean, she asked them questions. I mean, some of the stuff that went to the cutting floor, talked about the first time he did dope, talked about, you know, their difficulties in terms of abuses, abuse in their lives. And so the women sensed, Ray, that, you know, I'm a human being. I would have liked to have grown up the way you grew up, but I didn't. I'm in this place. I want to change it. And my big so hope was to change it. So you a vehicle it. for those women in particular and women in prison generically. Do you care whether some people view it skeptically or are you no. past that being concerned? It was a great expression in NAA, right? It says, uh, what you think of me is none of my business. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's to the point where, you know, I am where I am in my life. And as long as I do what I believe to be is God's will in my life, and if people want to be critical or if people want to be laudatory, ultimately, God willing, I'm not responding to that. I'm just trying to respond to women that I care deeply and passionately about who have, who are doing what they ironically were taught to do and want to do things differently, but are living and operating in a system that frankly doesn't give them much of an opportunity. Jim, one of those women in the dock calls you the dream seller. No. Oh. You are selling a dream. Sure. Is it one that you can deliver on? Oh yeah, I, I think we have. You know, it's just not just me. I got a great team and um, a wonderful team, um, and yeah, I think we are delivering on those dreams. We're, we're each of the women that come out. We're giving them six months of transitional housing, sober housing, um, so that they're being tested to make sure that they're clean and that they're sober. All of our women are working. All of our women are working. As I shared with you off air, I mean, we have women with criminal jackets, 26 felony convictions. They are all working. And in addition to that, it's also faith-based that we're we're linking people to. Um, a church, a community, a mosque, so that they have a community, and community is so critically important. We're so short on time, but... Oh. The <laughs> well, one, I want to thank, Cindy, I want to thank you, and I want to thank Ray, and I want to thank Due Process. You know, there aren't many shows that are focused and, and in a purposeful way on these issues. And when you look to how much we're spending nationally on incarceration, as to the fact that we're the largest incarcerated persons in this world, I mean, this needs to be a focus of how we can do it better. And if I can, also the children of incarcerated persons are six times as likely for themselves to be felons, so that this problem is growing exponentially. Jim, we're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> but our thanks to you. No. And 
you in the audience can see the full documentary on HBO. And you can see Due Process right here every week and on demand at dueprocesstv.rutgers.edu. For Sandy and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. For me, it was the need to be acclaimed, the need to be adored, which ultimately brings destruction. And so my truth is that I am a gay American. So in the first act of your life, you had two wives, two daughters. Tell me about act two. Coming out was a great gift. And I'm like, I'm gay. Seminary was something that I always wanted to do. It's remarkable how grace works in our lives. I feel that I am called to help these women. We started to call them the dream seller. We don't even believe in ourselves like that. So keep selling us this dream. We're on this journey together. I mean, selfishly, it gives me purpose. No one should be defined by the nadir of their existence, by the lowest point in their lives. Everybody deserves a second chance. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.